So I think a focus on portraiture has something to add to architecture, particularly portraits which seem to be profoundly environmental. Over the last half a year, I've been thinking about Cindy Sherman's portraits, her early portraits in which she depicts herself as a character in a movie. In these portraits, she's always inside constructed scenes, a mysterious woman on the street of New York City, a rare beauty buried in library stacks, or a young woman getting ready in her bathroom. But the scenes behind Cindy Sherman in those portraits didn't necessarily strike me as fundamentally architectural until Untitled number 175 was brought to my attention. In this portrait, Cindy Sherman's face is visible in the reflection of a pair of sunglasses, but it's located in the background of the portrait and not its primary focus. Instead, various objects typically relegated to the background of the portrait are showcased in the foreground. Half-eaten pastries, empty tubes of icing, and a towel that's soiled with vomit occupy the primary focus of this sandy beach scene, building a different kind of portrait than Cindy Sherman's earlier work, in which the background was postured as an accessory. In this new portrait, the background elements become the portrait itself. More specifically, they build not only the image of a portrait, but also the character of the portrait. In this case, an image of a woman and the subject of perhaps bulimia, or maybe the desire for a perfect beach body. So I've been thinking about how various kinds of portraits can help construct both the object of one's body, but also certain hidden narratives, hidden narratives related to an individual's personal experience or their points of contact to larger cultures. And the elements that allow that to happen are the things which frame a portrait's figure. Objects in the scene, the lighting, the framing. These elements help advance the connection between an individual and the environment around them, or in other words, their spatial surround. Scenes which bear the weight of building a portrait's subject. In Vermeer's self-portrait, The Art of Painting, he builds a scene of his artist studio in which he situates himself. His constructed world illustrates his focus on his canvas while he builds yet another portrait of a young woman. The tone is one of seriousness, studiousness, focus, and expertise. But several hundred years later, Edouard Charlemont repaints the same scene, changing the frame of reference. New objects become visible in the scene like the painter's face, a model of the ship, and the opposite side of a curtain, which is pulled back in Vermeer's original scene to reveal the artist studio. But now, the drawn curtain reveals a woman washing a dish. Reorienting the subject of Vermeer's original away from the mastery of a portrait maker, and perhaps, as Sarah Ahmed suggests in her depiction of a philosopher's household in queer phenomenology, toward the people that make room for the portrait maker to work. In these scenes, we can understand that there's a creation of a character through the objects in the scene, but also through its framing. We can begin to understand that there are narratives related to how one sees themselves in the world, or perhaps how one wishes to be seen. And therein lies an element of desire in the construction of a portrait or a self-portrait. Whether it's a desire to be seen in a certain way or to build something desirable, the orientation of a portrait subject relies to a certain extent on will, or to paraphrase Andrew Holder's description of Andy Warhol's Mario Banana No. 1, a sheer force of will which builds a scene from previously disassociated elements. And in contemporary settings, these questions of reorientation, desire, and hidden narratives make me think of different kinds of portraiture, particularly portraits dealing with queer subjects and personal experiences. And I wonder what it would mean to build a queer self-portrait, Or I wonder what it would mean to build a spatial portrait of the perfect boyfriend. Where would it be set? How would it be framed? And how much of this portrait would actually be a portrait of myself? This was the focus of my previous work titled The Perfect Boyfriend Builder, which is woven into today's visual conversation as well. But on that track, Peter Berlin's portraits were recently brought to my attention. His double exposure self-portrait photographs drawings by Tom of Finland, and also his films, which are salacious in nature, but are no less important as portraits of Berlin. And in all of these images and pictures of Peter Berlin on the street, he's dressed in a certain way that hyper accentuates his maleness. And I say maleness because the clothes that he wears in his portraits hyper accentuate his anatomy, but do not always conform to structured narratives related to masculinity. 
In the film That Man, Peter Berlin, we see more than the constructed persona for the intention of film and image production by gaining access to his home. Here a new image is composed within the confines of his home. Collections of his hyper-male portraits are surrounded by other objects and artifacts in his home, including recreations of fluted columns, figurines, busts, dried flowers, plants, and other artifacts that build a new portrait of Peter Berlin that hadn't previously existed until the documentary of his life was produced. And I saw Peter Berlin's home as a kind of gallery. Of course, the photographs were hung with great care on the walls in the most prosaic sense of a gallery. But the other artifacts of his home become part of the spatial portraiture that Peter Berlin built for himself and for and with his lover. Reorienting a home as a kind of gallery, I think, is a profoundly spatial act and not merely a descriptive act, especially when reorienting a one-floor apartment as a site for a precious collection, a unique collection. I see it also as an architectural act, but unlike a painted portraiture, the apartment itself, the walls, floors, the hardware, wasn't necessarily custom built, it was more custom described. So I began to wonder if in painted portraiture, one can situate architectural elements that express a character as distinct. Can this act be translated to a spatial portraiture as well? What does that mean for architecture? But I think it's that idea of making room. Maybe it's an absurd speculation, but I wonder if Peter Berlin had the ability or the desire to alter the walls around him to respond to the artifacts that he was curating in his home, what that space might have looked like. And in Sir John Soane's museum, we can witness exactly that act. There appears to be almost not enough physical space in the building to host all of the artifacts that he collected. Vases and busts are set on balusters and on balconies. Insets are carved into walls so that entablatures could be inset into the architecture itself so they can be experienced in the way that they would have been experienced in their native location. Scale models are set inside large model cases, which themselves have columns that mirror those represented in the museum's collection of antiquities. So the artifacts collected by Sir John Soane begin to impact the organizational rationale of the building that they're hosted in, not only by distributing discrete artifacts throughout the spaces based on a programmatic rationale, but also by impacting the building's form. Walls themselves break with their own definition as barriers and surfaces and are deepened in order to store paintings upon paintings when there was no wall space left. Wood paneling becomes concealed cabinet doors that when opened reveal a kind of cabinet of curiosities layered with paintings, more scale models, statuettes, and bas-relief tablets. The museum itself is something that is highly altered by the artifacts that it hosts, and in a sense makes room for Sir John Soane's unique and personal interests. And in doing so, it blurs the boundaries between what we understand to be a typical building made of architectural components, and reimagines them as frames, these components that is, as display pedestals, and as proxy contexts for dislocated treasures. Last year, I visited the Marciano Foundation before it closed, and encountered a series of photographs taken by Catherine Opie inside Elizabeth Taylor's home. And like the Sir John Soane Museum, Elizabeth Taylor's home is filled with many personally curated artifacts. There are artifacts that are set on shelves that are built into the walls to host all of these precious things. Awards, statuettes, and trophies are set next to small sculptures, which share space on a shelf with pictures of Elizabeth Taylor with foreign dignitaries and celebrities. But there are also objects which appear to be more like tchotchkes. There are also timepieces. There's a folded American flag, candles, medals, and behind all of these artifacts are mirrors that double the space of the shelves, duplicating the collection and providing a reflection of oneself when viewing these artifacts placed into the walls of Elizabeth Taylor's home. And in this particular photograph, Catherine Opie's silhouette can be seen if one looks closely at the bottom center shelf. In other areas of the home, Catherine Opie documents Elizabeth Taylor's jewelry, her wardrobe, her kitchen and dining nook, all of these spaces containing artifacts and photographs from Elizabeth Taylor's life. One of Catherine Opie's photographs in particular is set up parallel in length to Elizabeth Taylor's vanity. From that view, we can see cases of makeup, lipstick, eyeliner, and in the background, flowers, a photograph, which is the only object set on the windowsill, and beyond the window, there's a luscious tree and a natural scene. But in the middle ground and dead center of the portrait is an empty chair. 
It sits ready as if it's awaiting Elizabeth Taylor to arrive and to sit for her portrait by Catherine Opie. Even though Elizabeth Taylor is not present in this portrait, the collection of images taken by Catherine Opie throughout Elizabeth's home, and this final photograph in particular, almost appear as a series of stage sets, waiting for a character to arrive. It's not a mere collection of spaces in just another home. The shelves, the artifacts, the windows, the empty chair, together they make room for Elizabeth Taylor and for Elizabeth Taylor specifically. And perhaps if I stare long enough at this final photograph, I will see Elizabeth Taylor walk into the frame, take a seat, and gaze back at me with her iconic violet eyes. The series of photographs sets the stage for a cultural icon by making room not for her body, but for her character. The act of making room becomes a simultaneously spatial and aesthetic act. But more importantly, the simultaneity is not one of parallel but mutually exclusive paths. The curation of artifacts builds character, but also influences the organization of space itself. In perhaps a more accessible example, the cultural triumph of appliances affected the home in this way. Refrigerators and dishwashers found themselves integrated into the organizational rationale of cabinets alongside the older oven and stovetop. Washing machines and dryers gave rise to various forms of laundry or mudrooms, and in some apartment layouts, enlarged closets. And the anticipation of televisions had a slight impact on punched window placement in newly reorganized living rooms. But in all of these cases, a cultural migration within the home was also taking place. Salon to living room, hearth to kitchen, and backyard clotheslines to laundry rooms a cultural and ultimately aesthetic reinvention of the various spaces of the home. And though I may not be able to argue that appliances caused this migration directly, they are nonetheless the appurtenances of a shifting culture which made room for something new, both literally and culturally. And perhaps it's a queer idea to seek out ways to make room for collections of things rather than describing those sets of ephemera as merely the evidence of culture, but rather as agents of change, or perhaps access, or building enfranchisement when employed in the act of building a spatial portrait. Thank you. 